Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the closing arguments in week 13 of the Sunny Balwani Theranos trial. 13, hmm? Lucky for some. Just as a bit of clarity as to what goes on, first of all we'll have the government making the case for the prosecution. This is then followed by the defence closing argument, and if the government wishes then they have a chance for rebuttal after that. It's probably a good idea at this stage to remind ourselves of the counts in the indictment. It's been after all a good four months since the trial started and there have been several gaps and delays in the trial process for one reason or another. So let's take a look at the actual jury sign-off sheet which will summarise this. As you can see here, the counts are all in respect of wire fraud. The first two are related to conspiracy. In other words, Balwani and Elizabeth Holmes conspired to commit fraud. One is in respect of investors and the other in respect of patients. From counts 3 through to 8, there are the specific instances of fraud relating to transfers of funds electronically, and these relate to the individual investors that we heard from throughout the trial. Counts 9, 10 and 11 relate to transference of patients' data over wire by means of a telephone call and or emails, and finally count 12 is in respect of payment for advertising that had false claims. So what happened? Well, to paint the picture, the gallery in court was pretty much full of spectators, so a relatively full courtroom to start the day. The court was called to order and Judge de Villa called for closing arguments. We had Jeff Schenk for the prosecution delivering these. He doesn't beat around the bush. Sonny Balwani and Elizabeth Holmes agreed to commit fraud in the hopes that they could buy more time for Theranos. Balwani knew Theranos was running out of money and instead of letting his girlfriend's business fail, he committed fraud. Theranos was cash-strapped. If he, i.e. Bawani, had been honest, then he would have had to tell investors the tech had not been validated by Pharma. It had no deals with the military, or significant deals with Walgreens at the time. It had no revenues, and its blood tests weren't reliable. Now, I'm going to be a bit picky here and point out that Schenk has made a lesser argument than saying he told investors the opposite to this, in other words, a lie. No, he's saying Balwani didn't tell them the truth. In effect, a lie by omission. I think that is important because, unlike the Holmes case where we heard through recordings where she spoke about those contracts with the military, etc., we don't have quite the same evidence for Balwani, but we will see that Schenk does point to some specific untruths or lies later in his argument. Schenk then does a good job of going through all of the witness testimony. It's quite a good tactic and sensible because it's been a long trial and don't forget it's been months since the jury first heard the original witnesses. Schenk is bringing this all back up to be fresh again for the jury. So we then get to some specifics. Balwani in 2014 told investors Theranos would generate $1 billion in revenues, primarily due to the Walgreens deal. He knows he duped Walgreens into the business relationship, and it's just a matter of time before that house of cards crumbles, Schenk said. We then had a specific case of an untruth. Schenk says that Alan Eisenman, who was one of the investors, did ask about Theranos' claims about its technology. Balwani reassured him that the science was sound and the tech worked. Because what's fatal to fraud? The truth, he said. Also, we heard Balwani spent time going through the Theranos financials with the DeVos family wealth manager. Yes, he adjusted some projections, but he stuck with a 1 billion projection. As an aside, this was for 2015 when we were actually in late 2014. There was a person doubling down on these numbers, he said. He said later, but I'm going to add it in here because it's relevant to the 1 billion forecast, uh, that Bawani's defence to the forecast is that it was aspirational, and obviously any forecast is a prediction and not a known quantity. Anyway, he said, these forecasts were wildly off. They're off by a huge margin, and not just a few dollars. A point fairly well made, in my opinion. We saw what Balwani showed to the Walgreens execs when he was trying to seduce them to do business. He made the comment that he was 95% confident that by the end of 2014, less than 5% of Theranos blood tests would be conducted with venous draws. In reality, it was still 40% 
by the end of 2014, he said. He then showed the jury evidence that he hid from investors patient complaints about the Theranos test. We had the CMS testimony which showed that Holmes and Balwani tried to sway their findings. Again, this wasn't shared by investors. And again, in my opinion, these are instances of lies by omission, rather than a direct untruth told. If you remember, one of Balwani's claims made by his defence team that he was told by the scientists that the tech was ready. Well, Schenk says that Theranos was validating assays because they needed money, not because the science was ready. Theranos workers were pressured to validate the tests despite the flaws, he said. We got to the LIS database that we heard so much about. Schenk says that Balwani is arguing that the missing Theranos database would show that the tests worked. Well, Schenk's counter to this is that even if this were true, it wouldn't clear Balwani of the investor charges, i.e. separate them if you find that way, jury, please. And the lab director, Adam Rosendorf, testified that the tests were unreliable even with the data in the database. Well, that was fairly clear. It's been a bit of a puzzle how the prosecution would address the missing database in closing. We now have it. Let's see what the defence says in response. And as he wrapped up, he said, the biggest threat to fraud is the truth. And he repeated this, as he said it earlier, and this was seen by at least one observer as a catchy phrase that no doubt he'll want the jury to absorb. There was then a break in court for about 15 minutes and we had Jeff Cooper Smith from Oric for the defence. His starting line was, Balwani put his heart and soul into Theranos and he worked tirelessly year after year on Theranos software and manufacturing deals and he worked with investors and hiring employees. In fact, he put his money where his mouth is, Cooper Smith said, and put $4.5 million of his own money into Theranos and also guaranteed a $12 million loan so that Theranos could make payroll and because of this unwavering and sincere belief in Theranos technology. He points out that the texts were introduced between Holmes and Balwani, but these texts were private, he said. In other words, in my opinion, they were just that between Balwani and Holmes, and so not by inference to any third parties. The texts were cherry-picked and represented times he was venting and upset. But that's not the whole story, Cooper Smith said. Witnesses had testified that Holmes was the, in quotes, brilliant and charismatic one, as he put it. She was the one that attracted the most powerful investors, Don Lucas and Larry Ellison, for example. Do you remember the investor call that was in the Holmes trial and played to the jury? Uh, the one where she made representations about the tech and military contracts, etc. Well, Cooper Smith said the government never played this to the jury in this case. We have to wonder why not, he said. Now, the inference to make is that if Balwani was in that meeting, and I think he was, then we didn't hear him speak on these matters. And so where was his participation in those frauds? The Theranos patient database is missing, he said. And prosecutors didn't call board members as witnesses, he added. You have to look at these things as Balwani saw them, with his own eyes and not with the benefit of hindsight, he continued. Things closed there on Tuesday and on Wednesday, Cooper Smith continued. During his second day of closing arguments in the San Jose Federal Court, Jeffrey Cooper Smith of Oric continued. I keep calling them Oric, but their full name is actually Oric, Harrington and Sutcliffe. Anyway, he questioned the credibility of several government witnesses. In particular, he made the direct point that one of those repeatedly lied on the stand and spent some time on this. Lab director Mark Pandori testified that he told Balwani that Theranos shouldn't be using its proprietary mini blood testing device, the Edison, when he actually advised the company to increase the number of Edison devices in use. You cannot believe a word from this man, he said. Pandori was at ease and presented to the jury like he was a professor in a classroom during the government's examination of him, Cooper Smith said, and he remembered all 19 emails the government showed him. In Cross, everything changed. He had memory issues with the 13 emails we showed him, he continued. Specifically, he pointed out that Pandori said during cross-examination that he did not recall a transition document he authored before he left Theranos. Cooper Smith then presented extract 
showing that Pandora's primary concern with the Edison device was that the company didn't have enough and needed to make more. He's panicked, Cooper Smith said. He's confronted with a document that is completely inconsistent with his testimony. Another instance was cited. This was in respect of the time when he'd said he'd like to discuss a plan to double the number of readers for the three main tests. What is Balwani supposed to think when Pandori says make more Edisons for needs of patient testing, Cooper Smith said. Is he supposed to think, oh, we've got a problem with the Edisons? He would need to make the opposite conclusion, that the scientific team is on top of this, he said. Noting that Pandori is still in the lab industry, Cooper Smith said that the former lab director doesn't want to say he approved of anything at Theranos. At this point, look at where we are, he said, looking around the courtroom and raising his hands. The defence then turned to the elephant in the room. He projected big photos of Elizabeth Holmes on the courtroom screen and tried to turn the focus onto her instead of Balwani. What was it about her that brought the spotlight and attracted so many people? Well, clearly at this stage there's going to be a contrast between Balwani in court and presumably flattering pictures of Holmes in the jury's mind. She's loomed large in this trial, he said. He pointed to Daniel Edlin a Theranos project manager and classmate of Holmes' brother, who said she could really hold a room, was an extremely engaging speaker and had a commanding voice. This is what attracted all these people, including Balwani to Theranos and the vision she had, Cooper Smith said. Still, he says, the judge will instruct you, the jury, that Holmes' case is not before you, and you cannot speculate why. You have to decide in this case Whatever happened to Miss Holmes is not something you should or can consider, he said. He continued, in respect of both investors and others, everyone was listening to Elizabeth Holmes, the company was her vision, and Balwani had bought in. Balwani's counsel also raised a July 2015 text where he said to Holmes, I am responsible for everything at Theranos. All have been my decisions too. The government points to that as some kind of incriminating evidence, Cooper Smith said. He continued, as COO, Balwani made judgments, but it's only incriminating if the prosecutors have proved their case. And that has not been determined, he continued. That's for you, the jury, to decide. None of these texts prove a crime. He said that the texts never say, let's do crime, let's cheat people, let's deceive people. In his summary, we heard Mr. Balwani put his heart and soul into Theranos and he never sold his stake in the company, even though at one point it was worth $500 million. It became worthless when the company collapsed. Just as a compare and contrast between Holmes' trial and this trial, which have been remarkably similar, we did have a couple of notable differences. We didn't have the star witness of James Mattis, the former Secretary of Defence and a board member of Theranos, and also Holmes herself, both of whom had testified at her trial. Bawani didn't testify in his own defence. And we had Schenck for the prosecution to finalise. He again brought up texts authored by Bawani, I am responsible for everything at Theranos. All have been my decisions too. Duplicating the text that the defence used. Schenck explained, he isn't bragging in this text. He's acknowledging his role. Schenck continued with another damaging text message shown to the jury and which was sent by Balwani to Holmes in 2014. It read, lab is a fucking disaster zone. Cooper Smith said, he knows that the lab is a disaster. The text messages prove knowledge of the lab disaster. It is probably worth noting here that during the closing arguments, Schenk has shown photos of every witness that appeared during the trial. A good memory jogger or reminder to the jury about what the individuals testified to. He went through each criminal count and according to a timeline displayed by himself, a conspiracy to victimise investors was executed between 2010 and 2015 and a conspiracy to victimise patients happened between 2013 and 2016. These were 
all years that Mr. Balwani worked at Theranos, he emphasised. Mr. Balwani is not a victim, he is a perpetrator of the fraud, he said, wrapping up his remarks. And that, finally, after many long weeks, was the end. The case was then referred by the judge to the jury, who retired. This was on Friday, so we are likely to see a jury verdict in this case during week commencing 27th of June 2022. I'm going to wrap things up here, so if you've liked then please hit the like button and if you subscribe you'll not miss out on the verdict when it's delivered. I'll also go on to cover any sentencing and also uh, cover sentencing in the Holmes trial which currently is uh, scheduled for September. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.